Welcome. We're so pleased to have you this afternoon at our second CEO forum. I want to welcome all of you here in the room as well as our audience that's with us on Facebook Live. I'm Megan McCamey, and I have the total privilege of leading the Go Beyond Profit Business Initiative, frankly, for all of you. I want to thank our hosts today. First of all, I want to thank Matt Reed uh -huh, uh, and Georgia CEO, who are phenomenal partners that help to promote our initiative and help to share your stories across the state. I also want to thank the entire team here at Jackson Healthcare. This place and the people are magical, and they brought this whole event together. So I want to thank every single one of them for uh, all that they do. I also want to thank our ambassadors who helped to imagine this initiative and helped to launch it. And many of them are, are sitting with us here and will be on stage. We have Charlie Evans, Eric Tannenblatt. We have Chris Clark, Sunny Dariso, <laughs> Rick Jackson, Paul Bowers. Thank you for getting this launched and started. And I want to thank all of you. You all, as Go Beyond Profit members, are the embodiment of this organization. You are sole proprietors. You're entrepreneurs. You run mid-sized companies, and you run Fortune 500s. And each one of you, as individual companies, you were willing to take an aspirational pledge to find your way to go beyond profit and care for your people, your community, and your business. And then together, as Go Beyond Profit, you are a compelling, distinguished, and inspiring group of companies that visibly care about your communities and about the state of Georgia. And we as Go Beyond Profit intend to come alongside and share your story and to celebrate your efforts along the way. And how we've started doing that is one, through things like the Extra Mile, which we've had 52 segments on our partner channel with our member, 11 Alive. We have John Duchesne and our fabulous crew here who did all 52 segments for us. And in partnership with David Rubinger and Atlanta Business Chronicle. We've also recently launched our Champion Award Stories. And this is where we recognize distinguished companies in the state that they demonstrate to us how do you go beyond when it comes to a culture, when it comes to demonstrating what it looks like to give your resources to the community, and how do you empower that community when you do it. And I'm super pleased that our very first inaugural award winner is with us today. We have uh, Kevin Greiner and Gas South, who just recently won the award, the very first one just two weeks ago. If you didn't see the story across our news channels, I have copies here. You'll see it in the lobby. It's called A Profile of a Champion, and we hope that you'll read it. And then today, this is another example of what Go Beyond Profit hopes to provide for you, which is opportunities to learn from your peers. And so now we're going to get started. And I'm going to invite to the stage Rick Jackson, who is the founder of Go Beyond Profit, as well as his day job as chair of Jackson Healthcare, and also Paul Bowers, our ambassador and the chairman, CEO, and president of Georgia Power. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for coming. Uh, but also, thanks for being an early adopter. Uh, I was uh, so shocked and pleasantly surprised when we asked Paul if he would be one of the early adopters of being an ambassador of something that had never existed before. And so thank you for taking that risk and thank you for being a leader and so forth. So we're glad to have you with us. Well, thank you. That was an easy lift. When you get a call from Rick, you got to say yes. But it, was, <laughs> it, you know, but it was really an easy lift for us. And your vision of trying to mobilize and what was just articulated is so impressive uh, for all of us. You know, we all have this passion to do something more than just our bottom line. And we do it in our own separate ways, but collectively having that very visual uh, aspect of everybody in Georgia doing something, mm -hmm. I think will lift others to say, let's take action. So thank you for what you're doing. All right, well, let's start off. Um, first of all, why don't you just share with, uh, with us your personal philosophy when it comes to corporate philanthropy and having a company to go beyond profit and just how you execute on that? Well, you know, there's two elements of this, uh, especially for me. It's a personal side and then there's a corporate side. And the corporate side had 
the underpinnings of a 136 year old company that was founded on a view that would be a citizen where we serve. That meant when we brought electricity to a community, you know, we were bringing things that uplift the community from an economic development standpoint. So electrification of the Southeast was a big deal. And it really drove the opportunities for others to get out of the fields and come in and do manufacturing or have other opportunities. So we created this hope platform. But that mantra of being a citizen wherever we serve has stayed. And what gets me so excited about what our team does is that they are engaged in every community in the state. And they recognize that we have to be more than just the electric provider. We have to be engaged. We have to make the communities better, be it on an education standpoint or be it just from an economic development standpoint or solve some of the issues that these communities are facing. So from a corporate standpoint, all I'm doing is trying to give more purpose to that and create a platform for more generosity. On a personal side, I always say what breaks your heart. You know, Andy says that a lot. And then what are you doing about it? And if you think about that and internalize that, so what are we doing? And what breaks my heart is from an education standpoint, can we get children in a position that can be into an element that allows them to uplift themselves to be more productive in the future? And, and I think we have mobilized that corporately, and, and I give a lot of time on that platform uh, very much as an individual. The uh, other piece from a standpoint of corporately, we've hired 14 teachers internally to Georgia Power. We're back in the classrooms. Um, we're doing third, fifth, eighth, and high school, where it's called uh, uh, energy power, if you will, where we are really engaged to develop um, a STEM-based curriculum, but grab hold of these kids and get them really thinking about their future early on. Thank you. Uh, so how, uh, when did this become personal and professional for you? What stage of your career and so forth? <laughs> well, my wife's a teacher. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so it really started really early. <laughs> when she was reading to me in bed, I thought, okay, I got to do something. Uh, but it really was, uh, she was a Title I teacher at, at first. And if you know what a Title I you know, class is all about, it's really those that need a little extra help. And that just exposed us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a hugging lady, and she would hug all these kids, and we would collect clothes and whatever else. But mm -hmm. that started the flame. So, what did you do that was different, maybe, uh, than your predecessor when you came in? What, what, what so we've had thirteen different CEOs, um, and for our history, and um, you know, you really see what's the best of the of the past and really plan for the future. And from that standpoint of really looking at what's needed. And the mobilization piece was pretty easy, uh, just to try to give purpose a little bit more than just the bottom line. And uh, create this generosity mindset. And we just rolled out, uh, some of y'all are familiar with Proposity, uh, we just rolled that out as an uh, internal motivator uh, for all our employees, where they can tap on an app and, and directly serve an individual really quickly. And that in and of itself, you know, is motivating them. So give you the statistics. Uh, on an annual basis, we uh, this past year funded about $21 million of funding across the state. And our employees gave 158,000 um, hours of service time to uh, the state of Georgia. So I think they're motivated. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, smaller companies that we want to get involved in. It's kind of the next generation. Uh, and uh, so that was a major uh, purpose. And a lot of the smaller companies uh, don't have the resources that, that Jackson Healthcare and Georgia Power has and is sitting there saying, yeah, but I can't do that. But one of the things uh, with a footprint all over Georgia, I mean, you're not just looking at Metro Atlanta. So what are you, what are you doing out in the hinterlands that uh, that really, you know, in a local Hayhara or, you know, somewhere in uh, Georgia, just uh, what, what, what do you do to encourage localization of the people that actually work in those areas? Um, uh, so they're part of the Citizens of, of Georgia Power, which is our activation entity that uh, does the service work uh, and 
we still have a presence from a local management standpoint. Uh, most of them will serve on the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chris, and will have, have some type of leadership role. And they're activated in that way from an economic development standpoint, but they also see the gaps. And when they're trying to recruit companies to these little communities or see the opportunities that might come to that region of the state, they see where they can really put themselves into a void. If it's on the educational platform, let's get people together and let's deal with that. Or if there's something that there's a gap in terms of industrial uh, development opportunities, they'll get into that. But they're always serving. There are coaches on high school, uh, baseball teams, full league baseball teams, there are coaches in basketball, they're active in their uh, religious community. They're just active. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I ask is that there's a little triangle y'all probably see running around on trucks. And I want them to shine that triangle every day. Somehow put an impression on that triangle, not just because the lights are out. I mean, that's a big deal. But, uh, <laughs> but just put a shine on the triangle. That means being involved. And uh, that means more than anything to me. You were sharing with me in the hall about the story about the bees. Yeah. Can you, can you share that example? Because sure. I think that's something anybody could do. Yeah, so we, uh, we've joined up with Bee Downtown. Have anybody familiar with that? Yeah, okay. So we have, yeah, we have three hives in our campus. Uh, we have a little courtyard and and it's been amazing to watch people come into our building. They're gonna meet with people, but they go straight to the bees. And uh, they watch them for a while, and I think it's a great you know, leadership. Uh, I was speaking to a group earlier, a leadership example. There's one person in charge, and it's the queen, which we all feel that way. And, uh, and that is, uh, you know, you see the dynamics of a hive, but What's more important is at the end of every year, they collect the honey. And three hives, we have 15 gallons of honey. So they're gonna bottle that, give it to the citizens of Georgia Power, and they'll do something with it, fund whatever event that they have to fund. We have a, a subgroup of the citizens of Georgia Power called Electric Kids. Those are the kids that need uh, scholarship help or just help in general. And, and over our careers, we've had, you know, linemen lose their lives in some of the storms that we've had. And that's another way to fund them. So the, the bees are working for our electric kids. Mm -hmm. so. so you talked about a little bit, uh, but just to drill down, what, what do you see your role as CEO of, of the firm and, and trying to, you know, make this stick and be uh, highly engaged? You talked about one example, but just how do you see your role within that, uh, within that? citizens uh, yeah and when you think about any type of leadership uh, role you know it, it's the casting of the vision it's to create the excitement about that vision but also it's the communication around the vision and it's communicate 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 and I have this fundamental view and uh, is that everything communicates uh, every word every action every um, message that you deliver is saying something about you individually and something about us as a company. And I think that is the motivator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a clear vision, it's pretty simple, but it is something that we communicate over and over again of our expectations. So uh, during your history, I'm sure there's some things that have uh, done well and some that's not done so well. Do you mind sharing with us maybe a an initiative or something like that that just didn't work the way you wanted to and kind of share what lessons learned in, in, in doing that? Or, or have you always been perfect in execution on all this stuff? <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> there's so many. Yeah, when you think about a career, you have all the lessons learned. Um, you know, we, we, I started at Gulf Power uh, uh, way 40 years ago, so I'm only 38. but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, you think about the moves that we have taken and the journeys that we've taken. Um, you know, every step that we've taken, you've learned something. And, and I used to testify on behalf of our company uh, in regulatory proceedings in front of Congress. Uh, I ran our utility in England, testified in front of Parliament. And, you know, you just march down, be at congressional hearings or whatever it might be. But my first endeavor and testifying I depended on um, 
information that was shared. You know, you have people that back up you and provide all this data. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and of course you study it and get ready for uh, cross-examination. But the worst feeling <laughs> in the world is to be on a witness stand and realize this data is not right. Mm -hmm. And the lesson I learned from that is that, you know, you can't always just depend on others. You need to be knowledgeable yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have to go deep with information and be, as we call it, you have to have a major in business. And, um, and having that major means you can have a conversation uh, associated with the data on any front and go down. That is critical from a leadership standpoint because they want to know that they can follow a leader that really knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. and that they have a clear understanding. Um, when I was a COO of our company over in Birmingham, all the operations of, of the Southern companies in Birmingham, and the chairman came to me and said, I want to swap you and Tom Fanning. Uh, Tom was the CFO, I was COO, so we swapped. And my response was, you got to be crazy. <laughs> you know, I had a bunch of CFOs report to me, but I'd never been the CFO, and you know, those are learning experiences, mm -hmm. and, uh, but you got to learn it. I mean, the finance community and the accounting community will not follow you if you didn't know it. Mm -hmm. uh, and how many of you are in the accounting finance area? You know that to be true. Mm -hmm. If you can't add the numbers, you're not going to be followed <laughs> at all. So, That's good. so uh, the people that are starting their programs and uh, of, uh, giving back and so forth from a corporate standpoint, what? What advice would you give them as they're trying to figure that out for themselves? What's your passion? Individually, what is your passion? And then in your organization and your business, find out what the other's passions are mm -hmm. and collectively try to create a platform that aligns with those passions. Because if it's directed by you, your passion only, only a few will follow because they might have that similar passion. But if you can align everybody else's passion, because there's going to be you know, lanes of similarities to the passion of your team. And those lanes are going to be in three or four areas, and you can create that passion for everybody else in those lanes. And you'll be amazed at the following that will create and the excitement that creates. Mm -hmm. um, can I take a side note? Right now, you know, as we look at the future and, and um, look at the passions of our organizations and thinking about wellness and how we recruit millennials and the Zers and all the other uh, alphabet group out there. Um, you know, how do you get them to really want to be in a utility, which, you know, utility, as some would say, well, it's kind of dull and those type of things. I can give you another perspective of that. But <laughs> and one of the things that one of our teammates come in, has come in is, you know, uh, therapy dogs. So we're going to have a therapy dog in George Powell. And uh, as long as they don't shed, they're great. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... Absolutely. you you got to do some things like that. Well, I think it's very wise because trying to get... If we all put together a giving fund right now in this room, it probably we could probably build another building before we'd all agree on where yes, we exactly. all give that money. It's just... So I think it was smart recognizing that people give to what they're passionate about and they'll be obviously more engaged. Let me add to that. You know, all companies at one time were just United Way funders, right? Yeah. Give the United Way and, yep. you know, some twisted arms on United Way. And you could see this flattening out of giving. They felt like it was an obligation, but not something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to do it because we do it every year. And when you open that spigot mm -hmm. to say, here's all the organizations that you can fund, man, funding went out the roof. Well, and because you opened it up. Because it was more personal. That's right. So uh, you've been a leader in uh, Georgia for a long time on corporate philanthropy and so forth. Could you mind giving us your perspective on the history of corporate philanthropy in Georgia and how it's evolved? Yeah, I, uh, that is a great question, Rick. I think, you know, it's, I think it's evolving beyond the United Way example now. And I think what you're doing to highlight what people are doing helps motivate people to do more. I know Dan Cathy at Chick-fil-A with the beloved event trying to create that, but I think, you know, what really catalyzed us was the West Side to some degree. 
where the stadium was identified and the needs of the community of being underserved and really recognizing what could be done if we collectively addressed it beyond just giving money. And uh, I think now what I see with the peer group is that they're all seeing different avenues beyond just the west side. What else can I do on education? What else can I do in technical school area? What else can I do on the needs of what their employees are saying mm -hmm. to them? And I think that's elevated. And I, I give credit to Dan really bringing that to the forefront. It was there anyway, but just elevated it for us all. And it shows what influence can do. That's what right. uh, uh, So what do you, uh, Eric Tannenblatt, when we were talking about this, felt like that Georgia was, you know, doing pretty good in this area in comparison. But I was just curious, how do you feel like Georgia <clears throat> is uh, doing in this area versus the rest of the United States or the world, as far as that goes? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's another good question. I think we, because we have a high-profile level brands within Atlanta, that it's being highlighted more. <clears throat> Uh, than any other area in the United States. There are good brands, you know, if you think California with all the technology-based companies, they're doing some things, but they're not, you know, really getting recognition for sh the stuff they are doing, but they're not doing it broad-based. And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves um, for corporations to motivate the community, for everybody else to join in, are they taking that leadership role? And some of the technology companies in the West are more insular. Uh, some of the companies in Charlotte, for example, the finance com uh, community is doing some things, but they're not that big. Mm -hmm. New York's doing specific things. Uh, you know, I can go to J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, some of the corporations up there. They're doing things, but it's individuals, not the corporations. Right, right, right. And, it's, and that's what you see as individuals, not the companies. Right. Well, you're running a public company, so how do you justify to shareholders to give away $20 million and a whole bunch of time and so forth like that? I mean, you know, that was uh, something <clears throat> that I personally never put philanthropy and company together for a long time until just re really recently. Uh, but of course, we're a private company, so how do you how do you uh, justify that? Ed, Ed told us a little bit about his approach too, but I was just curious. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you see the tape after this. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's easy uh, from the standpoint of payback. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the aspect of us being involved and engaged and being part of the community is an element of customer satisfaction. And if your customer satisfaction is elevated, then there's going to be a favorability to mm -hmm. the company and, and the things that we do. Yeah, being a regulated entity, you know, mm -hmm. we're always in the paper. There's always something going on. Uh, but we get the credit because we were there. Right. And I think that compounds to if you take care of the customers, you take care of the employees, the business is going to take care mm -hmm. of itself. When we were launching this and doing some research, I asked Bernie Marcus about this concept, some thing, ideas and so forth. And of course, you know Bernie, and he was just, he's like, but most of these companies, it's just a check in the box and some PR person wrote it and, and all that. And that guy over there has no clue who they're giving to. I, I won't mention who he was talking about. But my sense is that you guys, it's not a check in the box. It's not just a press release. It's uh, throughout, so I want to commend you that. Uh, so we're going to open it up now for uh, Q&A for anybody that wants to ask any questions and uh, to put put him on the spot. We don't have any news people. That, well, Lori's here, so I don't know if that, no. <laughs> That's right. Questions? Anything goes. You can ask anything. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so our yeah, power team. Yeah, re repeat yeah that so the question is, what about the curriculum, about our efforts within the classrooms? Um, the curriculum is STEM-based, and we worked with the state in assuring that we comply with their requirements in the classroom. And we work with the math 
uh, community, the science community, ensure that we have the right boxes. But it's primarily, you know, uh, as you would expect, electricity. I mean, it's electrical engineering type applications, but it's the basics. Um, so go read your meter. How many kilowatt hours did you use today? And what could you do to change that? So the children will go out and read their meter and then they'll start doing the subtraction. What happens if you do this? And so it goes from that standpoint all the way to electrical circuits for the high schools where they're putting together circuits and doing robotics and those type of things with the curriculum. So it's a gambit of the STEM <coughs> curriculum, but it is a slant to energy and energy production. Uh, they get to go on field trips to a nuclear plant as an example, which uh, you know is pretty exciting for the kids. Mm -hmm. It is a, so it is, you know, the question is, is it part of the curriculum uh, of the state? It is approved by the state with the workbooks and, the, and it checks the box for the teachers that have to teach certain areas within the classroom. So it's approved. It's not a part of the overall curriculum because we can't be in every classroom. So we've touched uh, right at one million children over the last six years. Uh, so we've been very active. Young, young lady back there? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. In this highly charged political and postmodern climate, how do you ensure that your values are represented in your giving and serving? Uh, so how are our values represented in our giving and serving um, in this environment that we're in? Uh, it, we have an overarching uh, lane of giving. You know, the passions of the, our organizations. There are areas that we have to think about when we're asked. And we will check those out before we actually, actually give. If they're in the you know, environment, or if they're in the education, or if they're into a, a service need, and primarily to a lot of organizations that will fund to help those that can't you know, really sustain themselves, you know, you, you have to look at the organizations that are doing that. So we, we screen a lot of the organizations and pre-screen, but you know, we at times, I'm sure, uh, can give to things that might show back up in the paper. And Kevin. we try to avoid that. Kevin? Yeah, Paula, building on that a little bit, you guys are you know, such an inspiration to me personally for what you do. But you know, with Georgia Power, you've got you know, you're, you're one of the most prominent companies in Georgia. You have so many different things that you can do. How do you get your employees engaged in some of those decisions and to what degree do you use more of a centralized model where you say, hey, here's the top down priorities that we have and it all filters down. And then how do you balance that with more of a bottoms up approach where you know you engage employees to help the company make those decisions? Something we struggle with a little bit against that as well. Well we have uh, so one of the questions associated did everybody hear that? You know, how do you prioritize uh, your giving? You know, we have a structure around that with a board uh, in terms of our giving activities. Uh, now the service hours uh, question is really localized. So that 100, roughly 160,000 hours are localized of activities that people will do. The giving aspect is overarching with the board, really thinking through 75% of the giving and the other 25% is back locally. And they were making those decisions locally, but the majority of the big gifts, if you will, come out of a centralized model. Okay, last question, yes ma'am, because they're taking me off the stage here, so I got a little watch. So my question revolves around the service hours. Um, it's wonderful, 160,000 hours of service, and you know that for people to want to give and to be passionate, a lot of times they have to experience and see it, go work a soup kitchen or whatever it is. Do you support a day of service, or how do they, do they get paid for so no, they don't get paid for the service hours. Uh, the MLK day is a, a day on, not a day off. We give that as a voluntary uh, opportunity for our employees to serve during that time. And, uh, but it's motivated off their own time, off, you know, off uh, employee's time. And um, they, you know, it's, it's 
the passion is what's driving all that. We have, so our internal group is citizens of George Power. Our retiree group is ambassadors of George Power. Ambassadors did, out of the 160,000 was around rounded up, um, they did about 25,000 on the retiree side. So we keep them in the family. <laughs> I'm not, we're done. Okay. <laughs> come on. Thanks. Come on. Yay. Thank you I'm so sorry. much, Paul. Yes, thank uh, you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe now you've heard of. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we have Jenny Levison, the owner and founder of Super Jenny. And also we have Jerome Russell, the president of H.J. Mm -hmm. Russell and Company, uh, an astounding uh, real estate and construction company native mm -hmm. to Atlanta. I'll have you sit over yeah. there okay. for me. Um, and so we're going to focus this. We try to listen hard to our members about what it is they want to learn from their peers. And one of the most resonant questions you've been asking us is, OK, there's so many things I can do. How do I pick? How do I focus in? And so we looked across the landscape and picked two what we feel like are extraordinary examples of business leaders intimately involved in the choice, but who have made very specific choices about what it is their company is going to focus on. So, Thank Hi. you very much for, <laughs> for joining me. Sure. Um, I'd love first to start out, you both have great personal stories that sort of undergird the values of your company. And I would love it if you would sort of start out by letting us know what are those personal values that have, that have motivated you to have purpose and have a focus be so integral to your business? Hmm. You want me to go first? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I think my main value is that I knew I wanted to be in the service industry and that hospitality and service, uh, th this isn't what I started out doing. I wasn't in the restaurant business. I was an actor in New York and then in Los Angeles. And I always had a job on the side in the restaurant world. And I slowly started to realize how much more I loved the world of service then I liked going on auditions all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so little by little, that that it became what's important to me. And when I first opened Super Jenny, when it was just myself and one other person, I think that it, that's what drew me. I was drawn to my community. I wanted to serve in some way, and it, it parlayed into through soup and through food and gathering around the table. So that's how I got started. Well, welcome back to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for going into Sue. My whole family, thank you. Okay. Well, for me, um, I'm part of a family business. Uh, my father started it uh, in 1952. Uh, we're in the various businesses from real estate construction to airport concessions to banking. Okay. And uh, so growing up, I saw him as a businessman and also as a very civic orientated individual and uh, also one who collaborated with all people. So I saw that growing up and as I evolved, we just, I just got engaged in different things. You know, I have this philosophy that you, you show up and lead. And so I've seen a lot of different things, a lot of different verticals. Uh, both on the business side and the civic side. And um, when my father passed in 2014, and we have a building in, on the west side in Castleberry Hill where we started our business. And uh, we moved out. Um, our company moved to Atlantic, Atlantic Station. And we never thought about selling the building um, because of where it's located. And we decided after my father passed, right before he passed, that this was going to be a legacy. And I didn't know exactly how, to, how it was going to play out. We just 
knew it, we wanted to do something different, so we dropped it into a not-for-profit. It was a 54,000 square foot building. We dropped it into a not-for-profit, and that really changed the game for me because you know I've always have come up in a profit-orientated uh, environment, so it really created a more collaborative spirit once we did that, and it's moving forward, and you know I'm real excited about it and talk about it later. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's go ahead. Let's delve in. Okay. Okay. Let's dig in. I've I've known about H.J. Russell for mm -hmm. a long time and admired your family's company. Um, why don't you tell us? I know you have several pillars mm -hmm. of what you do. You want to hit on those pillars and then dig in to the one that's just launching right now. Sure, sure, sure. So you know, most people know if, know what of us is H.J. Russell and Company which is a construction and real estate, real estate company. So we've been involved in some projects like we just finished up Mercedes-Benz, the uh, African-American Museum in DC. Um, we're doing the tunnel project. It's not as glamorous as Mercedes-Benz, but we're mm -hmm. boring. We're part of a team that's boring the hole into uh, the Chattahoochee so you can fill up the quarry. So that's an interesting project. So we've been involved in all sorts of projects throughout Atlanta. We also have an airport concession business, which is 40 years old, just celebrated 40 years. That's in airport concessions and airports. And then we're part of a bank. I'm, um, our family is the majority shareholder in Citizens Trust Bank. Um, and um, this new pivot, which I'm, and I have an older sister and a younger brother. So it's three of us, and we all really own everything, a third, a third, a third. So about two years ago, I made the pivot to kind of, you know, what I call is, is to be more of a owner versus an operator owner. And my pivot was to this uh, innovation center. And I've just had fell in love with that component of my life now. And it's evolving. Like I said, we are uh, setting up a center where it's focused in on economic empowerment uh, with, around African-American business formation. So it's entrepreneurship, the business formation, uh, creating. Oh, the, our thesis is that there's a widening gap of wealth disparity here in the city. I mean, it's going on across the United States. And, and it breaks down among racial lines where blacks are you know, liquid poor, um, don't really have the wealth, and et cetera. So we want to attack that because we are um, we're blessed. We're blessed to have resources, we best, we're blessed to have relationships, and we want to try to create an environment where we all collaborate to uplift um, um, you know, African-American businesses, and, hope, and that will uplift the overall community um, in, in Hull. So that's kind of where we are, it's exciting. Um, getting a lot of support um, from a lot of different people, and um, we're at the early stages of this. So it's called the Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Correct. And it's housed in that family historic building right mm -hmm. there on the west side. Correct. Um, and as you get that launched, and it'll, it has maybe 100, I think you told me. Current 100, 100 members. Current mm -hmm. members who are either in the um, incubator portion mm -hmm. or in the small business learning part. But you're also, while you're standing that up, helping address some of those issues right there on the west side. I, saw an amazing story taking your expertise around subsidized housing mm -hmm. recently. Yes. And yeah. So how, how's that going, and how are your people feeling about that, the people who work for you? Okay, so my father, back in the 70s, he was a prolific HUD developer. And HUD, uh, so we, we are in the largest owner of HUD properties in the state of Georgia. So we... We, the properties are getting older, so we have to kind of recapitalize them. So we just took a elderly tower of 150 units in the old Fourth Ward, mm. and we have another one over in the Summerhill area, and we did a uh, you know, complete renovation of it, and um, we basically was able to preserve that affordable housing for the next 15, 20 years for sure, because once you do these programs you have to stay in. So that's the other thing that's going on with, with wealth inequality. You're starting to have housing inequality. And that's it's really becoming a big issue um, in the city. And you know, we just we we have to get more 
as a community more proactive to address that. So we just felt that was a little thing we could do to right. help it. You know? No, it's not. It's not little, mm -hmm. <laughs> and certainly not little for mm -hmm. those tenants who get to sure. stay and thrive Correct. in their community that they've likely been for generations. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, Jenny, I know you have the Zadie Project. Yes. Um, can you tell us about the focus that you've taken with your company? What it's all about? How it lives out in a daily way, and how we might know about it, especially the Zadie Project. Sure. Well, first of all, let me tell you what Zadie means. If you don't know, it's Yiddish for grandfather, and uh, so for me, uh, talking about a little bit of legacy, that uh, my father is known as the Zadie in our family, and he really gave me my very first recipe, which is my dad's turkey chili, our very popular soup. Um, so how it started. I think, I mean, I, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary, so we obviously haven't been as long as, as Georgia Power, long, <laughs> around that long. But uh, it really was probably about four years ago. We, we all meet as a company once a year. We close all the shops. We come together and have a summit, and we talk about where we were, where, where we are, and where we want to go for the next year. And I just started feeling it was time to come up with something more. Uh, when you're in the restaurant business, you're asked to donate things all the time, your time, your services. And I just felt personally um, a calling that we needed to do it on a bigger way. So I decided, and it's not like I knew what I was doing in any way, shape, or form, but I thought, this is, I want to start a nonprofit leg of this business, and I want to get our entire company involved. Uh, so we sat around and brainstormed of ideas and the Zadie project basically it starts with a personal mission which uh, you know what breaks my heart is people that don't have food in our own community uh, especially children uh, especially children in the title one school system the families that are really trying to do everything they can but they're struggling and have to decide sometimes if they're going to pay their rent or have buy groceries and I wanted to come up with a way where we could give them nutritious meals that weren't processed foods uh, and that I didn't know how I was going to do it, but th that's where it started, that I, I had this idea, I sort of outlined it, I had a vision, I presented it to the company as a whole, and you know, we talked a little bit about how, uh, Paul's talked about how to get the whole, your community and your people involved, and they're not always going to want to give in the same way that you want to give, but even if they're not, if, if, if um, hunger is not their issue, they're excited to be part of something in their job. Doesn't have to be the issue that they're involved in. They're involved whether they like it or not. <laughs> Just by being, you know, because part of our initiative, part of the um, nonprofit, anytime anyone buys turkey chili at any of our stores, 100% of that money goes back to the nonprofit. So the cashier, you know, maybe hunger isn't their thing, but they're still part of something. And so is the customer. Uh, so we sort of are going through the back door, you know, to, to make it happen. No, I, I think I, that answered your question. I, I forgot what it was. No. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely did. And I, I happen to know, um, I, this is on film, so now everyone will know that I, <laughs> that I do eat at Super Gen <laughs> every week. Um, but I'd love, because it's so practical and tactical, which mm. our companies are always asking us, how does your mission, your focus, your choice show up every day? You talked about it for the employees. But you, you figured out how to make it show up for everybody that comes in contact with you. Right. I mean, for me, it's just become not about just serving everyone food when they comes in, when you come in the door every day. My mission is to serve, to be part of my community. Um, I'm from Atlanta, but I really did not grow up here. I've been back about 25 years, and I knew if I was going to be here, I wanted to create something that was part of my community. And to be honest, yes, the bottom line becomes less important to me. Uh, so that doesn't mean I didn't make so I have to make some personal sacrifices as well. I'm sure I could be living in a much larger house if I didn't have a nonprofit or if I wasn't willing to put my own money and my time in. Uh, so it's just part of become part of who I am. Yeah. I mean, in, in the scheme of things, we're a very small company. We have just under 50 <laughs> employees. So, but we're we're small, but I'm present, and that 
to me is very important. Well, and every day if you stand in line at Super Jenny, which you have to, um, because there's so many people that want the soup, um, you get to read about the Zadie project. And you know that, every, that you know it's her dad's chili. You know, so I think it's, um, it's an amazing, I hope you all will go to one of her locations <laughs> because it'll be the most practical way that you could see how you or your company could actually implement your purpose or your mission on a, on a daily basis. And, and Jerome, I know that you bring back a lot of your purpose back into your company with your pillar, Russell Cares. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you tell us how your employees sort of touch and feel your focus? Sure. So Russell Cares is something we set up maybe about 18 months ago and through our two main companies, Concessions International, which is our food and beverage airport company, along with H.J. Russell and Company. We have one called Russell Cares and CI Cares. And the focus of those uh, uh, purpose-driven uh, initiatives are education, economic empowerment, and you know just overall well-being of the community, uh, particularly around some of the properties that we may own and manage. So uh, it complements well. One of the things that we've done, my daughter is very engaged and leads to CI Cares, and then Paul kind of runs the H.J. the Russell cares, and it's just a, it's just our way of getting in the community. You know, we got to we have to be present, and we have to um, project you know a positive light as we go forward. So that's what it what it what it's what it's about. Well, you clearly have some great stories about. Are you gonna I was just going to add to that too that I've noticed with all of us who've spoken so far is that there's no getting around if you're a leader rolling up your sleeves and being part of your nonprofit and being part. You know, right before I came here, I was slinging soup for the Zadie Project. Today's our day that we package soup. And that's how also being present and your employees seeing that you're actually involved. You're not just telling them what's going to happen and how to do it. I, know. I would agree. You're living it. Yeah. Um, OK. We also hear sometimes, uh, I, I have to get up every day, turn the lights on, worry about payroll, make sure my business is profitable. One of the reasons we picked the name Go Beyond Profit is because being a thriving, profitable business <laughs> is incredibly important. It's fundamental. And then we can sit here and talk about what does it look like to go beyond. So we have some people that say, gosh, I'm worried about getting started, or I haven't pushed this because it's distracting to my business. Have you seen it strengthen your business? as much as it's another thing you do? Well, I'll go first because I consciously made the decision with my brother and sister that I was kind of going to go down this path of kind of taking a slight pivot. Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you go into something just being, doing the right thing and helping others or using your blessings, you're going to get blessed. So I don't really, I, I can see it coming, but I can't tell you how it's going to manifest itself. But I feel very, very, very good about what's going on and what's needed. And so, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Jenny? Does it strengthen I, your business? A hundred percent. And exactly what Jerome's saying. And I think you have to decide. I'm laser focused on the mission of our nonprofit. I don't know, I should probably ask Keith, one of our key um, management team is here, if we are profitable this month. <laughs> it, it could be a good month, it could be a bad one. But the, it, my- Can anybody relate? I know, <laughs> is, you know, as a business owner, I, I have to look beyond this month and next month. I want, I, this is part of the business now. Yeah. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get it there. And if that, you know, it, it can mean all a variety of things, it's non-negotiable. That's fantastic. Have you had any feedback from your employees? <laughs> yes, I think I'm insane. <laughs> <laughs> Should we bring you to the stage? I know. Uh, I think yes, and it's really interesting to me. And sometimes I say I'm, I'm, I get worried that they're not as engaged as I want them to be because I feel everyone should want to care about hunger and maybe you know, and everyone's we have a wide variety of ages. But I know I see their sense of pride when someone asks about it. So they might not be the person that's coming on Wednesdays to help us, but I've, I've witnessed people who I didn't think cared when someone asked them about our nonprofit that they are part of something. Mm -hmm. So, yes. 
Yeah, same thing. I, I, and I'll go with the, because remember, I kind of pivot out about two years ago, so I'm not engaged operationally as I used to be. However, I see the Russell Cares, I see it starting to kind of come full circle. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we gave a $5,000 contribution to Tuskegee University, and they came, we met at the Russell Center, the team came in all their shirts, and I was shocked at the number of people who, you know, came from Russell Cares who wanted to be a part of this. It just, you know, it was very warming to see that Again, I'm having really not engaged in it day to day, but they are engaged. They are engaged. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It, it was clearly meaningful. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, your peers would love to have a sense of what something that you've tried, it didn't work, I've pivoted, anything that, that uh, maybe it's in um, your distribution of your, <laughs> or as you're building, you know, oftentimes, uh, I think Paul hit on it. The giving the, the gift to a nonprofit, certainly worthy, certainly important. Creating initiatives, creating something from scratch comes with its own set of um, troubles. What, what have you either learned or has been a stumbling block that you've overcome in building your very own thing? Well, I think I, in the beginning, I mean, I truly did not know what I was doing in any way, shape, or form. And I had a vision of that we were going to, we have a farm, we're going to grow the food, turn it into soup, and get it right to the schools. And you were going to be able to, you know, before you get on your bus, take this food home. And obviously getting into any school system is, is very difficult, almost impossible, if you're just someone off the street like me. So there were lots of challenges of how how can I get this to them? And you just start learning your way around the system if it, if it has to be that way. Uh, I mean, I had, we had lots of challenges. Was the farm gonna sustain what we're doing? There, but little by little, uh, you just find your way and you have to ask people and not be afraid to ask for help and get people that are, that, you know, they say hire your weaknesses, get people mm -hmm. that can help you do the things you need to do. I think that's a great piece of advice to, to own your weakness and see if you can't find <laughs> I have no somebody problem to come along. How about you? Uh, I, this is maybe the last 60 days. I'm getting uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, because this is a so not for fresh. profit. Yeah, this yeah. is a not for profit. So, um, so, I think, you know, it's, it's so I have to. Ask people, I mean, we're about to do a capital campaign or a campaign, and it's not a natural tendency for me to say to go to Sonny and say, Sonny, hey, um, you know, I'm doing this. I believe in it, but it's forcing me to really, um, you know, express where I am and why it's important. Mm. And it's exhilarating, to be honest with you, when you have others to be able to follow you on something that's really important to our community. So... That's the, I just have to say, okay, this is, you know, I had a meeting today with someone, all y'all will know, and he, he got what I said. I felt like I was very effective, and I just went to check in to say, hey, this is what I'm doing, and he will be supportive of what we're doing, um, but um, so, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm just getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you for, yeah. for sharing. I, I was saying to them before, they have such compelling focus. Can you really argue with a company that provides delicious food with really fighting for children to have access to nutritious mm -hmm. food? And then we all need to become better informed about the rising income mm -hmm. inequality in Atlanta and find ways. And thank you for leading the way and helping us think about how we might provide more job experience, work experience, whatever, to help alleviate sure. that issue. So thank you. Okay. I'd love to um, offer the you all the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so does anyone have a question for? Mm -hmm.
And I struggle with the fact, uh, do we uh, look for an organization to get behind and support that's already formulated, or do we look to uh, formulate our own? And um, the attention that's necessary, I really don't have any idea. Is it like uh, creating a brand new company and, and starting it from scratch? Do we have the bandwidth? So can you speak to the marker that let you knew, let you know that, hey, it's time to start our own and time of supporting others. I'll repeat the question. It's a great one. And if I summarize it correctly, I hope, and that is, do I choose to support an existing nonprofit in an issue that I care about? Or do I make the leap to begin an initiative on my own? And uh, what, what, you know, with all the bandwidth issues and all the concerns about that, how did you make those choices? How many employees do you have? In the beginning, I, I got a lot of advice to hook up with a, a, an organization that was already formed. So, and I did look into that, but I had such a passion of like a small niche just in my community that I wanted to serve. I wasn't finding what I was looking for. So I would really go back to the, you know, what is your passion? Are you the, gonna be the one to start the initiative? Are you willing, and it, it's like creating a whole new company. For me, it's like a whole nother job. <laughs> well, and I, I was going to say, I think you're saying the same yes, thing. Yes, yes, it's, it's a pivot. It's a pivot. It's a different pivot, but it's, again, it's very exhilarating um, for it's me. It's taking those business skills to, as Paul would say, where your heart's broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, yes, my son. And you used to donate the profits to charity and you used to pay what you wanted when you went to the restaurant and you had the best Sunday brunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it just got bulldozed yesterday. Wow. I'm so about that because I thought it was great. used to keep coins and used to charity and all that. Yes. That is great. Uh, yes, we had a restaurant. It was called Cafe Jonah, which is my son, who's now 15, uh, in Buckhead for five years. And it was my original goal was it was a pay what you want. You know, I'm sure you've uh, people have read about these restaurants around the country. Um, and there, there's a perfect example of an idea that failed. Uh, we, the first two weeks, people, you couldn't believe how generous they were. We were had so much money to donate. And then after that, people start to pull, pull back. And it was a, a great example of a business that was never profitable. We were just, it covered the expenses and it covered payroll. But, you know, it, it was a difficult... And we, we started pulling back. It used to be every day, pay what you want. Then we went to the weekends, pay what you want. Then it was just Sunday, pay what you want. <laughs> and then it became we weren't covering the bills, basically. And I was cover, you know, covering the pay what you want. Uh, so it was, I, I don't know if it was we, because we were in the center of Buckhead. I, it was a tough model for us. But it, you know, it was born from my passion. And I was going to see it through no matter what. So it was a great uh, opportunity for us we did we would every um, quarter we would have our um, our own our own community you could vote we would support three different uh, charities in Georgia so we would get votes we would have baskets when you made a purchase for your lunch we would give you a coin and you would put your coin um, in the basket that were you what you wanted to support and at the end of the month we would take the money and divide it between you know those charities hmm. one last question <laughs> so do do you support, encourage, equip your people to serve on the boards and steward nonprofits in your local community? This is the your, your is it your existing bit of for 
for-profit businesses. Correct. Does H.J. Russell encourage its people to serve on boards? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 How about you, Jenny? Well, we were up and running for six months before I knew I had to have a board. <laughs> So we're still working. So you know, there's a learning yes. curve. You're, Talk you're, about you're the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very much for That's this. Has much. been incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that was Power Chat One. We're now going to transition to Power Chat Two. This one is about purpose and your people. How do you actually? implement your purpose into your daily business so that it's sort of sticky to your people. Oh, am I not? You're not hearing me? Okay, good, good. Okay. I'm getting good coaching. Um, and so I want to invite to the stage Jill Campbell, who is EVP and Chief of People and Operations at Cox Enterprises. Did you see I got that all right? That was so good. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, and then Shane Jackson, who is the president of Jackson Healthcare. Thank, Thank you, you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I would love to get started on this one with a little bit of a definition for everyone. And that is, would you take a minute to, to define for yourselves, for, for everybody, what you mean by an intentional culture? What does that mean definitionally? And then, if you wouldn't mind, define it and say, this is how we got started, and this is where we are in our company journey to make it real. You want to get started first? Well, that'll take like an hour. So <laughs> sorry, Shane. I'm, yeah, he won't get a chance. Uh, well, let me start with we are a privately held company. For those of you who don't know Cox Enterprises, more than 100 years, um, similar to Jackson, we have a, a very long, long history in this community. But we have about 55,000 employees worldwide and two anchor uh, divisions. One is telecom, so cable, internet, etc. And the other is the automotive industry. We also have a media group and we're in the process of selling all of it except the AJC. Very difficult because that's where our, our company started. So I tell you that because we are now uh, two years into the fourth generation of the family stepping in as the CEO. Mm -hmm. And so it the culture was driven by our founder, which you speak about in your book. And Governor Cox, he's the governor of Ohio, little known factoid, he ran for president, not making that up, and his running mate was Roosevelt. Hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, so um, he, his values, his personal values became the company's values. It is literally in our DNA. I grew up in the company 37 years, so I, my personal values are his values. And I remember a story where one of his daughters said he, she was sitting at his knee practically and asking him about the company and, and what he thought. And he said, never forget these things. One, our employees are the reason that we have everything that we have. They built this company. In fact, he left it in his will. He said, to my children and my stewards, never forget the debt we owe our employees. I mean, that's how how much he felt about that. Two was, we have businesses in local communities. It's very important that we give back to those communities because our employees live and work there and we're making our living there. And then three, his, his uh, third one was always do the right thing. Doesn't matter what it is, you make sure that you're doing the right thing. So those are things he just anecdotally told and then it flowed through chairman after chairman. Mm -hmm. So when Alex Taylor, who is our current CEO, came in, he asked me if I would move over from Coxcom, I was running operations there, to help him start to build what he wanted to be as a CEO and what's his legacy. And so all of that was you know, embedded in the culture and people knew all of that, but we felt like we had to put a name to it and a purpose and really put to life what Alex believed was the right thing for the future. So we actually partnered with a guy by the name of Simon Sinek. I don't know if you know him. He's written a lot of leadership books. And he agreed to take him on. And we did this amazing thing where we interviewed all of our employees, prospective employees, partners, and asked them what makes Cox special. And then we talked to him about what drives him and what, what makes him want to come to work every day. And we came up with a purpose statement 
or the why, as Simon likes to call it. And our purpose statement that we rolled out about two years ago is to empower our people today to build a better future for the next generation. Powerful because his next gen, right, his kids, powerful next generation of employees and next generation in the community. So we took that and then did, you know, the hows. And we've got, I've got a brochure if anybody wants them, but it's, it's things like do the right thing always, make a little music because we want our employees to have fun and things like that. And so we just continue to ingrain that into the culture and everything we do has to go back and tie back to does it support the why and the purpose of our company. So long answer to that Perfect. one, but that's really the evolution of how that occurred. That's fantastic. Thank you. That was great. I know. What, uh, <laughs> what am I supposed to talk about again? I'm, what is? I, I feel a little overwhelmed right now. That, um, I, this, first of all, hearing Jenny and Jerome talk was really moving to me, and uh, and, and and hearing. Jill and, and people talk about business leaders talk about their business and the way that they view it through through this lens and what they can do is um, uh, it's it's just compelling and it's encouraging and and I think it's um, you know the question about w w what is culture and, and ha ha where are you on, on that journey um, and I did write a book about this and so if you want to read really it you can. Um, because it was really about our journey of learning this and what you just heard from Jill I think is a, is a perfect answer. Um, you know, journey the way, I, excuse me, culture the way I define it, it's the atmosphere that results from all the actions that a group takes to accomplish its purpose. Like it's just, you know, all the stuff that we do um, it, it kind of rates in this atmosphere where you know here's things we do here and here's things we don't do here, right? You hear culture statements like, oh, we don't say that here, right? <laughs> or no, we would never do, or this is the way we do it. That's, that's the culture. It's, the, it's, it's what you know what we do. And, and um, we went through this journey. Um, we don't have fourth generation. I'm only in the second generation. I'm excited for my grandkids hearing that yeah. story. Um, um, but we went through this, through this journey of, of uh, you know, my father started the company uh, 19 years ago. Um, and it, as I was transitioning into uh, the role that I'm in today of really thinking about how do we sustain our culture through leadership transitions, through growth, uh, sometimes through acquisitions, you know, kind of whatever it is. And this is, as Jill just said, the actions that you take as an individual, the actions that you take as an organization, they're driven by your values and your beliefs. Um, I, I had, a, uh, I was, with someone last week and they were kind of asking me about this topic and they said like how, how does this like you know your your view on corporate impact or, or, or community impact and co like what, what do you do with that at work and it was the the pretext of the question was like what's the project that you have or the program you have and i sat there for a second i said that's kind of like asking me what does my body do with air like what's the project i, I don't know how to distinguish um, how our values, that's not a project. That's not, that, it impacts everything that we do, right? And the, and the conversations that, um, you know, th that we've had is that I think sometimes we, we come to events like this, or we come to topics like this, and we think, oh, I've got to go check the community impact box or the philanthropy box and we need to have volunteer days or we need to whatever. I mean, like, I love what you just heard from Jenny because this is, like, this is her business, right? It's, this is how we're thinking about, I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to feed people and that, and that just, like, that's how we run it, right? And, um, and you know, hearing stories like that gives, gives me hope because um, if you, uh, uh, if, if you're inconsistent with that in the different ways that you run your business, if you do try to just check your box, check that box of community impact, uh, that causes problems. Do you have, like Jill spoke to, do you have sort of building blocks or, or pieces that in your journey you've come to to be able to articulate your purpose or culture? Uh, how do we how do we articulate it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we really uh, similarly I, th I think uh, talk from a couple of perspe perspectives. Our purpose, our mission, as we call it, uh, is to improve the delivery of patient care and the lives of everyone we touch. Uh, we haven't been in the healthcare business. I don't know if there's anybody else in here from from the healthcare industry. Is anybody else in here from the healthcare industry? Yeah, there, there's a few, which kind of depresses me. 
uh, honestly, healthcare is one fifth of the U.S. economy, and it, it, any event I go to like this, I think we represent about two or three percent of the people that are there, um, which is really kind of depressing because what we get to do every day is like save people's lives, literally, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, that's and so that's a pretty good business to be in if you're interested in helping the world, right. um, and so uh, and so that you know that kind of helps. But what we tell people is that it's the second part of that statement, that purpose statement. Uh, improving the lives of everyone we touch that is, is uh, I think, maybe a little bit different, uh, a little bit unique. And that's the part that really drives the way we think about our entire business. Um, it's not just a feel good kind of a thing. It, it, it impacts the way we think about our customers, the way we impact each other, uh, the way we think about how we live in our community. Because our job is, what I want for my life is that the people that I am able to interact with um, are better because of that. And that's, that's how we drive it. So that's, that's really how we frame it. Okay. And I know on our call together, I had the privilege of, of listening to a super practical way that you at Cox Enterprises have taken the notion of a purpose statement mm -hmm. and sort of activated it in your business and enabled your people to be really a part of it. Could you, I don't yeah. want to give away the, the name, sure. but I'll let you do that. But could you speak to that? Sure, so one of the things when Alex took over that he, why he asked me to come over, was to reimagine the employee experience. You know, we heard commitment to employee, blah, blah, blah. And so once we had the purpose, the uh, other chief people officers who run the divisions and I got together and we said, because they're separate divisions, and so they'd have this policy and this one wouldn't have the same policy. And we want people to be mobile and be able to grow their career wherever they are at Cox, even with startups that we're investing in. And so we came up with this concept that we call EX Lab, which is Employee Experience Lab, and we literally built one, kind of an innovation center. But what we did was we asked our employees, we did what's called journey mapping, and we interviewed about 17,000 employees, and we asked them what they loved about working at Cox and where are areas that they felt we could do better, and we mapped them on a, a grid. And not surprisingly, they love the benefits that we provide. We, we're a pretty good healthcare and um, wellness provider. They loved the people they work with and they love giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. Things that they didn't love were things like career advancement and the ability to go from you know, location to location, the recruitment process, which also ties to that and a few other things. So we decided to put together 20 projects to start because we're really ambitious. <laughs> and we didn't want to hire a consultant. We felt we had the most amazing people who could tell us what we should be offering and how we could better recruit to our company. And so these project teams are led by a leader that might be an accountant dealing with performance management. And then we put people from across the divisions, from drivers in the auction, all the way to vice presidents you know, of a cable company. And we asked them to just tell us what they thought we should do with, I'll give you performance management. And we base it all on design thinking, which the premise of design thinking, if you deal with your customers, is one is empathy. You go back and you ask your customer, in our case the employees, what they want. It's what does the user need? And so they did that. And then you do benchmarking, so what's out, what's out there competitively. And you go and you come up with ideation. You prototype it. You go back to the customer, ask them again. You do showcases with business partners. And it's a very disciplined process. And in every single one of these cases, and so far we've had about five that have come back with recommendations, the problem statement was not what we thought it was because we had a bias about what we believed our employees needed and wanted, and it was totally different. And so that's been one real big aha. And the second was, this has been huge development for the couple hundred people so far that we've put through it. Mm -hmm. They have learned more and grown, and they feel like they've owned everything that they've come up with because we have implemented the recommendations. So the first couple were pretty cool. Um, we moved to a standardized and different PTO. We have flexible, unlimited PTO for exempt. And then we added PTO in for non-exempt. Uh, bereavement, and we used to say, show us a death certificate. Like, <laughs> and so you, you, you grieve for who you want to grieve for. You can take five days whenever you want. If you need two days now and four days later, that's fine. We trust you. Uh, and that was a really big deal. It touched every employee. Um, then we gave all of our employees 16 hours of paid time off for volunteering because that is so core 
to the family and who we are. And what we have found from that is they're using it as team building. So we have t-shirts and they go out as teams and do the volunteer work together. And if they want to do stuff on their own, then that's fine. And they don't have to prove it and turn it in. We just trust that they're going to do that. So those were a couple that right off the bat, we got some big wins on from just living the purpose and empowering our people to make the decisions and that we trust them to do the right thing when it comes to their job. So it's been pretty cool so far. So I'm, yeah. I love this so much. And we had a call like last week mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, the group and, and you know, because Megan and Patty wanted to tell Jill and I what they want us to say and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and and like, I totally hijacked the call because Jill started talking about this idea. And See, then for so the next half hour, yeah. I just asked her questions. I about how they're doing it. Back to you. So yeah. but here's here's why I love this. And it, which it's, it seems a little bit weird, right? You come to go beyond profit and we're talking about how are we serving the community and, 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 and all that sort of thing. And Jill gets up here and talks about PTO. What do those things have to do with each other? And I think this is such a great example of what I was just talking about in, in, in a very practical way to apply it of how do our values, they shape everything that we do. How do they shape, shape our view on PTO, mm -hmm. right? How do we think about the ways that we engage with each other, with our employees, associates on a day-to-day -day basis our values being applied there. Um, and, you know, as much as I love the things that we get to do in the community and the amazing things, the stories that we hear about, the biggest impact that we have are on the people that come to work for us every day. I mean, the biggest opportunity, frankly, I have in my life, much, much beyond anything else that we're going to be able to do in the community and the cool things we could do around the world are the 1,600 people that come to work here every day. And the interactions that we have with them. And I think, you know, as, as someone we have been a small business, if you're a small business today, don't get intimidated by, hey, we have to go fund teachers or we have to be able to feed kids. Like, if that's not where you are, you can have such a great impact in taking your values with you every day and how you interact. I, so um, I saw a study last week that shocked me. According to the survey, 41% of people in the United States have a negative view of capitalism. 41% of people in the United States think that capitalism is a force for harm in the world. Think about that number. That's almost half the people out there. And this is not a political statement, but we wonder how people like Bernie Sanders and others that are advocating socialism are getting the following that you have. Almost half the people in the country think it's for harm. Another study I saw, though, there's an organization called Conscious Capitalism. It's a great organization. They're a partner of ours. I highly encourage you to get involved with them. Um, they surveyed uh, uh, a lot of their members, asked them the same questions, and the people who work for companies led by leaders who agree with these tenets, that number's 13%. So if you don't think that in your role that you have an impact, you are greatly underestimating what you can do. I mean, you know, the, all the problems, the things that Jerome was talking about, the problems that we have, government has failed to solve. Our social institutions, to a great degree, have failed to solve and are incapable of solving. What we represent in this room is the greatest force in the country to be able to solve some of the challenges that we face. We have access to resources that just simply don't, other people don't have. We have influence that other people don't have. And it's not just what are you doing in, you know, through these programs, it's how do you show up and how do you treat people and apply your values every day? And if this group does that, it's, uh, it'll change the world. Well, and if you're, you, know, you asked earlier about the business impact and can you really afford that, every study shows that the next generation, millennials, Gen Z, oh, they care deeply yeah. about what's going on socially. Mm -hmm. And if they look at a company, and, and that's one of the reasons we looked at things like PTO and what our employees thought about giving back, if they don't think you are a company that cares about the world or them, they're going someplace else. So if you just want to recruit really great talent, you, you have got to be socially conscious as well. So that's a good business reason right there. Absolutely. <laughs> to, do, to, re to attract retention, and retain absolutely. your employees. And, and the productivity. And I would say, though, to yeah. that point, though, it is important to young people. I think it's important to all people. But what's even more important is that you're authentic about it, right? Because yeah. if it is an organization you espouse certain values and things that you're interested in, and 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 that's what's in your marketing literature and whatever, and then they get in and they work for you, 
and they go, know. yeah, 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 but this is not how they live. Right. Right. It's a problem. Yes. Right. Definitely. Well, and I think, you know, in our first power chat, we talked about what it might look like to reach out. And in this chat, we're hoping to talk about how that looks when you look in um, on your database. Shane, you all have, have seen some rapid growth, um, and yet you have this intentional purpose. Can you tell us all what you think it looks like to sustain that on a given Wednesday? What does it look like on a, any, any old day? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's what we were just saying. And yeah. I, I think the, uh, um, look, I really think this shows up through your leaders. And from, from my perspective, my, my job uh, is to make sure that our leaders understand our values and beliefs, uh, our purpose, our values and beliefs, and how we uh, take those to market, right? And how we, how we apply those. And so, um, and so that's, that shows up in how do we treat our customers? How do we handle a situation where something's gone wrong with a customer and we're on the phone and they're yelling at us? Not that that ever happens, but every once in a while it does. Um, how do we, how do I as a leader, how does that show up when I am having a, a disciplinary conversation with someone who reports to me, a performance review? How does that show up when I have to fire somebody, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's where it is. And so that's, that's a big challenge for us is, is helping people understand uh, that, that this is not just something that shows up on our you know, Love Lifts initiatives or, or uh, whatever, or with our customers, it's consistently applied and, and making sure, frankly, our leaders know how to model that because if they do, then that will cascade through the organization. So that sounds like one incredibly important strategic sort of block to success, a building block. Are there others that you can think of that you think are incredibly important to success in building purpose, other sort of imperatives for success? Well, I, what I said earlier is listening to your people mm -hmm. and you know being in tune with that and making sure that you're meeting the needs that they have. I do got a little Java with Jills. They branded it super cool. <laughs> Java with Jill. Is it good Java? Organization. Like, what kind of coffee is it? Yeah, I drink tea. So oh, I don't okay. know. <laughs> but I ask everybody this question. I say, um, if you could give me one word to describe how you feel about working at Cox, what would that be? And almost to a person, no matter what division, what level I'm at, the two words I hear the most are love and family. Mm. Well, that, that's every day. You mm. feel that. And, and you would get a really good sense quickly if they're uncertain or pissed. or you know, I, We have a few of those given where they're at in their careers. But that's, that's the atmosphere when you walk around. And so that, to me, talk to your employees just like you talk to your customers it's they'll tell you mm. is it important to um, to your purpose and how do you deal with it if someone's not living your values they go away yeah <laughs> well I, there's a vulnerability to both They're, sides of they what go you're talking away. about I, yeah. I always say you know you can be as skilled and be the best engineer whatever but if you are not the kind of leader and show the behaviors that are important to us then you should probably find someplace else to work. That you have to guard your culture. It's very important. And different, you know, the different people bring different viewpoints, and that's awesome. But the underlying values are non-negotiable. Yeah, we have a saying uh, around here that hires refine your culture and fires define your culture. Yeah. Um, and like you know, because when you bring people in, the values, beliefs they have are going to impact and shape the group. Um, but when you terminate someone's employment over a values issue because there's misalignment, it really does help great clarity among the rest of the team that you mean what you say around that. Um, and so I do get into arguments with our HR team every once in a while on this. I don't see any of them in here, so I can't get in trouble. But uh, on those few occasions where we do have to terminate someone's employment over a values issue, I want to make sure people know. Yeah. I mean, not specifically, you know, we're, we're not trying to get into gossip, but say, guys, when we talk about treating other people with respect, we mean it, right? Yeah. And that we didn't feel that was the situation here, and they don't get the privilege of being a part of this community anymore. Yeah. Exactly. That's amazing. Do you have um, sort of a key action or key piece of advice that you would share? You've given so many, but is there another one in your mind that you'd say, if you want to get started, if this is important to you, Leave the room, write this down, go do this. I did. 
<laughs> <laughs> I re honestly, that this big aha was just go ask your employees. Yeah. Just start, do something. You know, you don't have to boil the ocean. And it's backed a little bit to the passion of what you care about. Just get it out there and start. And I also think benchmarking is great. Go around and talk to people. You know, just what Paul was talking about earlier, I, I was, oh, we don't do that. We should. Mm. So I think it's important to not, we call it don't navel gaze, because we, you know, we really like ourselves and our company, but you can get very myopic. So open up your lens and just ask people. People love to help. I, I love all the vulnerabilities of the things you're saying for your company. You're taking risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You really have to important do that. risks. You have to do that. How about you? Um, I like I like both of those. I would uh, I would add. I, I think it's very worthwhile for us as individuals before we think about organizations as as individuals to uh, be very honest about what our values are. Uh, most people, if you ask them what their values are, they don't know. Um, it, it, they'll tell you. You know, they'll probably make it up because and they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. Um, but we just, frankly, most people don't think the time. Uh, don't, don't take the time to think deeply enough to be really honest about what their values are. And I just think it's a good exercise because whatever that is, that's how you're going to show up at work. Um, and then having that self-awareness gives you the opportunity to be purposeful uh, about driving the culture that you want. Yeah, that's Amazing. Good. I'm confident there's a few questions out there. So I'd love to open it up to give you all the opportunity. Was remember. there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at the culture of our company now, and we're looking at possibly creating the interview process, but like, you know. yeah. Oh, we absolutely do. We, we have this unspoken, one of the, the mores that you, know, you get in your culture, mm -hmm. that if they, don't, if they don't meet the values and the culture, then we reject them like a bad organ. It, it's really <laughs> amazing what happens. I will say we over-index on people getting in. People always say it takes forever to get into Cox because like 180 people interview them. If the janitor's available, bring them in because we so protect our culture. So we probably, you know, could four people's probably sufficient. I think we could get at that. Um, and we hire from within a lot because we have, you know, raised these people along the way and we believe in succession planning. That can be bad too, because back to swimming in your own bathwater, you've got to bring in new people. Um, but it's it's really important. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just echo. It's it's a huge. I don't have the organ analogy. <laughs> That's a little, little gruesome, but uh, you're in healthcare. You get yeah. that. Healthcare um, people, you get that. But. Uh, no, but we do. So what the, the way we look at it is that your uh, the required skills, required experiences, kind of table stakes. Right. They get you the interview. They don't get you the job. And so um, it's it's we're definitely looking for cultural fit. And the um, so actually to start about benchmarking. Like I actually learned a lot from Chick Fil A about how they do this. I think they're quite good at it. And uh, but one of the things that uh, I think if I just tell you nothing else is for whoever's part of that interview process is to make it part of what they're evaluating the candidate on, yeah. right? And there's good tools and things you can give them to kind of help do that. But if nothing else, just make them think through that interview, is this someone who's going to fit in culturally with us? Um, and, and, uh, and if you get consensus on that, chances are you'll be pretty close. Every time somebody, we have asked somebody to leave the company, it is not because they knew how to do the job. That's right. 100%. It's because they didn't fit the culture. Yeah. So totally. that's why it's so important. Yep. Great. Another question? It's not really a question, but for Shane, I know mm. one of your stories that you told, which I think is so impactful to so many, was mm. really your training for your leadership team mm. and the places that you take them. And the mm. one Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to repeat the question, it's examples of how do you train up your people who lead in your purpose. So Lori shouldn't be allowed to ask me questions because she knows too many of my stories. That's <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll try to tell this story kind of quickly. Um, we've heard today about volunteering and, and being able to serve. Uh, my view is that giving someone 
the opportunity to serve someone else is in itself a huge gift. Um, because uh, there is something that you experience that you go through when you have the opportunity to very humbly and selflessly serve someone else. And, uh, and just that experience and the emotions and the lessons that it gives are tremendous. And so this is several years ago. Um, there's a, a, a great organization um, in town uh, that I bet a lot of you know about called City of Refuge. Mm -hmm. And we've had a, a partnership with them for, for a while. Um, and so I had my senior, senior team and I told them, hey, we're going out to do a team building day. I'm not telling you where we're going, just dress in comfortably, comfortable clothes. And so we had a couple of vans, you know, pull up in front of the building, and we shepherd in there, and we're and we're driving down, and and the the common wisdom was we were going to play paintball and <laughs> shoot at each other, um, which was not the case. But I but we did on the way down uh, ask them to do an inventory of where they spend their time, and just write out what, the buckets of your life. Where do you spend your time? What do you do? That's right. And then as we start, you know, if you guys have ever been there, we get off the interstate, go past it was the Georgia Dome back then, you know, and start <laughs> driving into a, a, a neighborhood that doesn't look very much like Alpharetta, Georgia. And, um, and people start getting quiet and what is going on. And Bruce and his team, uh, it, was, it was an amazing day where we got to serve the people at City of Refuge. And they also had us go down to an apartment complex down the street and go door to door to tell those people about what City of Refuge could do for them. Um, which was, it was just incredible. So we go, th we go through this experience, we get back to one of the rooms at City of Refuge and we pulled back out the papers that people had filled out on the way down and said, based on what you've gone through today, I just want you to look at this and see if there's anything that stands out to you. And the, the thing I remember mostly from that day was a lady that works for us, she's a senior vice president for us. Um, and she just looked at it and she said, I've realized that the way I spend my time is shallow. Hmm. And uh, so the cool thing about that was, is that is actually what started the program of have, where now every team in our company is expected to go out at least one day a year in service somewhere in our community. And the cool thing about that was, is that I didn't start that program. What happened was those people got back and they said, I want the people on my team mm -hmm. to have the experience of service that I just had. Mm -hmm. And so they just started taking their teams until we finally said, this is a cool thing and we need, we need to all do it. Um, and so, uh, you know, somebody said this, this earlier about the importance of rolling up your sleeves and, and doing it. Uh, it's important to serve, but I think when you do that, realize that you are giving a gift to the people that you've invited into that process. It's really neat. To say, well, my clock is done, and <laughs> I promised you I would be done mm -hmm. to get you on your way. We could spend, I personally could spend hours more. Um, gleaning from you, but I thank you very much oh, for your time. You for I thank us. you all for being yeah. here. Uh, thank you.